Hello, everyone, and welcome to our monthly In Conversation With. Um, my name is Griselda Togobo, and I'm the CEO here at Forward Ladies. And today I will be in conversation with the super wonderful Sherry Atchison. Now, Sherry has just a sort of background and career journey that will keep you all um, inspired and provoked to go back into your workplaces and into your businesses and to see what you can do differently. So I'm very delighted to have her here with us for the next 30 to 45 minutes. So please um, grab your teas, your coffees, and, um, and let's get cracking. So Sherry, thank you so much for making time for us today. Yeah, of course, thanks for, thanks for having me. Yeah, so I started off by um, commenting on Sherry's accent. <laughs> Those of you who know me know I have a thing with accents. I love them um, because I think they tell us so much about the people and, and um, just the stories and the lives they've had before now. So Sherry, tell us a bit about your accent. Um, I mean, I'm Irish, so I have an Irish accent. Um, probably not expected from my face, um, which is what I get quite a lot. And I'm sure quite a lot of people on this call probably face similar things when it comes to having an unexpected accent. Um, but yeah, I was adopted at three weeks old and raised in Ireland. So I have this lovely thick accent now that I will never get rid of. <laughs> and where are you based now? Um, I live in London at the minute, yeah. Fabulous. So how is lockdown treating you? I mean, it feel, feel, I guess the start was much harder now. We've been in almost a full year, really. And me and my, my partner have really been very strict with it. So obviously cancelling all holidays as you should, staying in the house, not going out, outside of taking the dog for a walk around where we live in Threatham and going to Tesco for our now fortnightly big shop that we do. Uh, sorry, he does. I don't bother. Um, and it's, 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 it has its moments. Sometimes it's very, like, very monotonous, very boring, and I guess frustrating. But I try to consistently remember that there are obviously people that are not as privileged as I am to have our own space, to not have any financial worries and so on. But um, there are certainly times where it is very trying. Um, my family's back in Ireland, as is my, my husband's. So that makes things sometimes a bit more difficult. Um, my dad passed away near the end of last year as well and we had to get back home with a ferry so driving to Wales to get a ferry to Dublin to drive up north so everything it makes things difficult but I'm trying to just you know take each day as it come and remember that you know it could obviously be be much worse <laughs> yes I'm so sorry to hear about your dad and thank you for those also listening you may see that there's a little person behind me who's been warned <laughs> not to enter the room but she's still here so we're going to carry on with the interview as much as we can um so i i mean I, I was working from home before lockdown and i found working from home it's been a bit challenging with the kids at, at home but i do love working from home and I, I you know it's my intention to keep doing that even when the world goes back to normal but how have you had to change your way of working to stay productive because I know you have a big uh, you know announcement as well about your book and you've been you've been really productive throughout this lockdown season yeah I, I guess I've just had to be <laughs> um really really strict with myself <laughs> but it's been really really strict with myself um work-life balance has always been I guess after a certain period of my career where I realized you know work is work and that's it um I'm really strict when it comes to making sure I don't do extra work after I close my laptop or whatever it might be um, and the only way for me to really keep that in lockdown because obviously my workspace is now my home space and I did yeah. work from home sort of two days a week anyway but it's much more different when it's five days a week and it's not through choice um, means that I have to just be really deliberate about planning the things that you would just always automatically do like oh I'm leaving the office to go home you automatically do that but you have to be deliberate now about getting up and doing things um, and I think having my own space is good my, my partner has a space separate um, so we both see each other at lunchtime and then in the evening so it's not like we're on top of each other on in our own space all of the time um, but I mean it's different but I like certainly moving forward when things do go back to maybe more normal I would probably I yeah I would still only be in the office two days one day a week because there's no yeah. need like if I can do a senior leadership role successfully from home then I don't need to be in the office so why would I bother there's the whole debate about 
you know, the role of the office space going forward. And yeah. I think it's not uh, going back or staying out. I no, think it's, it's a hybrid a depending on what people need. Yeah. And, and now that we know that it's possible to work from home, hopefully a lot more companies will take that on board and not be as stringent, you know, yeah. as they were before around working from home. Yeah. So you mentioned your leadership role, and I know you're only 30. You've, you've said that to me yourself um, before, and you've, you've had several global leadership roles. So can you just tell me a bit about that journey um, from the little girl in Ireland who had the accent, who faced some challenges, and then being in these roles where you're, you're helping companies really um, tap into talent? Yeah, um, I mean, things are not always easy which I think is fine for the most part. Um, I, so as I mentioned, I was adopted at three weeks old. My brother was also adopted at three weeks old um, from Sri Lanka. Both my parents are white Irish people. Um, and there's a lot of privilege in that. And I talk about this quite a lot because I think it's really important that pe like privilege is incredibly nuanced. And there is a privilege to having a name like mine and an accent like mine where you cannot tell, for example, I'm a brown woman until you see me. And obviously in my field, I am well known, so I don't quite have that anonymity, anonymity but I also have the privilege of senior leadership. Um, and I think what's important there is like certainly growing up in Ireland is, is a unique experience. Um, where I'm from is rural Ireland. I'm, I'm not from a city, so I'm from a, a small village up north. Um, certainly there were not very many other people of color that I can remember. I, I remember certainly in school photos, you know, when you get the big long school yeah. photo with everyone and it was always really easy to find me and my brother because we were the only two brown faces in the entire school. Um, and that's, you know, it's fine whenever you're cute, you're young and everybody thinks it's adorable, but then you do get to a stage where it becomes very racist um, and very difficult. And certainly, um, you know, me and my brother's called the n-word quite a lot, called all of these other different kinds of slurs where um, had a lot of racial abuse and stuff that my um, my dad certainly nipped in the bud as soon as he could and dealt with all of those different kinds of things. But what's important is, you know, there's that kind of treatment changes how you work, how you operate, how you view yourself. And certainly, you know, I'm very confident now. I'm very confident in what I do because I know I'm really good at it. Um, but certainly when I was younger, I was very shy. I was bullied quite a lot. Um, it was very, I guess, awkward in, in I guess how I would talk how I would carry myself and so on because of all of those different kinds of things and certainly as I as I grew up um, and really became I guess came into myself as the only way I can kind of describe it like yeah. you know harness the the skill set and stuff that I had um was really by you know going to university and so on and I'm not from a wealthy family so my parents were on benefits I was on free school meals at school and um, I had to get every single grant and bursary you can imagine to be able to go to university I'm still paying off student loans <laughs> but um the, the point is like certainly that was very instrumental in shaping um how I viewed the world the, the perceptions I have the reasons why I do things and doing that I became a software engineer so I have a computer science degree um, if you've read any of my pieces on Forbes etc you'll see that I am very data driven and I think that's incredibly important when it yeah, comes to DE&I and I. Um, needs to be analytical and technical as opposed to fluffy and theoretical only um because that's how we get things changed um, but yeah I became a software engineer then I started doing quite a lot of work in DE&I so in Belfast, there is, you would imagine, as you'd know, it's not very diverse from any real standpoint. So certainly um, from an ethnicity standpoint, Northern Ireland, 2% um, of the community from the last census data um, are from black, Asian or minority ethnic backgrounds. So very, very white, as again, you would expect. Um, and again, when it came to women in technology, it wasn't a lot of women in the company I joined, in the room that I joined with 19 people, there were two women, including me. Um, and so I wanted to do something about it and that's where I found Women Who Code. So at that stage, Women Who Code, based in San Francisco, had around 5,000 global members that ran free monthly meetups for all of their, all of their global locations. Um, we're now the world's largest nonprofit globally dedicated to women in technology, well where we have over, thank you, we have over 230,000 global members. We give over $1 million worth of scholarships to women in tech per year. 
um, and I'm now an advisory board member. But what, where I started was I took that branch in San Francisco and took it all across the UK. So I opened up lots of branches in the UK and in Europe to really create, I guess, something different. What I didn't like was that there were a lot of different organizations dedicated to women in technology that were either company centric, which I didn't like, and also that they potentially charged people. And I didn't like that because not everybody could afford, you know, 10 pounds to go to an introduction to Java um, session. Does that mean that those people don't deserve to have the opportunity to upskill? Absolutely not. And certainly as someone who came from a background that knew how important even like the, a pound <laughs> is, um, that was really important to me. And so I, I started doing a lot of work in that space. Then I led inclusion at Deloitte across the consulting practice. Then I was head of DEI at Monzo Bank. And now I'm the global director of DEI at Pecon, which is an employee success platform. Wow. And you're only 30. You're only getting I, I, um, started. Excuse me. My birthday is at the end of next month. So I'm 30 right. next month. Yeah. Wow. So one of the things I wanted to pick up on is, is your confidence. So. Mm you know, you, you've talked about in the, in the later conversation I've had with you, you've said, well, I'm too good not to be paid for what I do. And you have a, a really authentic sense of worth and confidence that is really beautiful to see. And I also know that, of course, on the call that we have, we have some fabulous women who are very confident and have achieved a lot, but there are some who are not so confident mm. and there are even more young women coming up now mm. who don't have that, you know, natural sense of confidence and worth so is there a defining moment that took you on that journey um and how did they come about um yeah i mean I, I definitely wasn't always like this and so i've been with my partner i think it's 10 years or it might be 11 i can't remember but either way like we talk quite a lot about i guess the different people that we are when we first met versus the people we are now and i certainly can almost not compare the Cherie of, you know, when I was 19-ish, um, 18, 19, to the Cherie now. And um, I guess the thing for me was when I'm good at something, um, and I've always been very, I guess, academically focused, um, purely from myself either. It wasn't like my family really pushed me because my brother is the complete opposite. Um, but I'm always very focused on feedback and understanding if I am good at something. And I spent a lot of time, I guess, harnessing that on like what am I good at and what do I need what do I want to get better at yeah. and certainly in my career I've won a lot of awards like I have an award cabinet just out of sight um, which is, um, but again you don't win awards if you're not good at what you do and you certainly don't win awards if you're not good at what you do and you're a woman of color from a poor background you have to be really really good to do that and there was a moment in my career where I, I remember like getting spoken over in quite a lot of meetings people would interrupt me and so on and now I remember at a stage quite a few years ago where the people that were doing that started to sit back and listen to me. And that was the moment where I realized, hold on, there's immense amount of privilege here that I now have in being listened. And yes, I've worked incredibly hard for that, but it is still a privilege to know that when I say something, people will shut up and listen because not everybody does that. And that gives you, I guess, a confidence that certainly for me that I've harnessed that. I am incredibly comfortable now saying, I'm really good at this. And that's why I don't do things for free. I'm really good at this. And that's why I'm a global director of a company the size of Pecon. And the reason for that, I think it's important as well, is that we're really conditioned quite a lot to actually, you know, be humble. And you can be humble, but you can also be confident. The two things are not, you know, mutually, mutually exclusive. exclusive. Yeah. And, you know, some people don't like that. Some people have told me, oh, Cherie, you're being- Tone it down. And I'm like, how am I being arrogant by saying I'm good at what I do? Do you want me to lie and say that I'm bad at it? <laughs> because it's very simply not true. And yeah. it's not, it, that's what's really important. I think it's important that we harness, if we think we're good at something and we know we're good at something, then that's simply a fact that you're stating that. Um, and I think it's important that we allow ourselves to say that. And I think certainly in some, in a senior leadership role uh, and who is well known in my field, it's important that I say that because although maybe somebody else will be inspired by it, maybe they'll do it too. Um, and I don't think we should have to, you know, dull down something about ourselves if we're really good at it, why should we? I mean, nobody else does, so I'm not doing it. <laughs> I love all that you've just said, Jerry, and particularly, I love your reference to feedback because I think sometimes when we take feedback, we just tend to focus on the negatives of the feedback mm. because we're, you know, you might receive 10 feedback that is eight that is excellent, and then there are two areas for development. 
And from my experience, we women just tend to focus on the two areas that we are being told to develop mm -hmm. and totally disregard the eight fabulous feedback that we've just had. And, and what you're saying is that listen to the eight that you've been told and, and take it in yeah, yeah and have the awareness that actually somebody must have employed you or taking you, your business on as a supplier because they believe that you're worth it so then why don't you let their confidence and their faith in you carry you through the next phase and that's something we need to hear now because as we are stuck at home um you know a lot with pe people are facing and uh, you know crisis in confidence because mm. you, who are you it's the God knows how many hundred days now that we've been in lockdown mm. and who, who are you becoming? Are you really the person you were before lockdown? Yeah. And we just need to keep reminding ourselves that we really are. I love that. I wanted to also share, uh, I wanted you to also share a bit about finding your voice. And I think Obama, Michelle Obama made this a big thing around women using their voice um, and, 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 and speaking their, their own stories and their truth. Mm. And um, and I noticed that you you use your voice. You're not you're you're not a shrinking violet. Mm. You you say what you want to say, and and you're very passionate about the areas that you're passionate about without dumbing down what you want mm -hmm. to say, um, if it makes anyone uncomfortable. Again, how did you develop that skill, and what would you tell somebody else who's really struggling um, to 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 just say what they really want? Yeah, I I think what's what's important. Um is to really remember or focus on understanding your own strengths and weaknesses or your growth areas. Because what, what I see quite a lot is it's really hard to articulate what you're good at if you don't know. It's really hard to articulate what your growth areas are if you don't know. And it's important to analyze you know, yourself, I think, in that way yeah. to really get that understanding because having understanding means you have information. Having information means you can be confident in what you're saying. And going doing your own progression in the way that you know let's say you're in a management position or moving into that kind of role you're doing this for other people but are you doing it for yourself as well and what you need to do i certainly that self-awareness i think is really important when it comes to you know like you said using your voice um, and will there be times that people won't listen to you or will disengage with what you're saying that will absolutely happen and what you'll also need to do or i guess be aware of is that that doesn't mean that you should stop speaking in its entirety you know that means that there's someone that doesn't engage with you whether it's through bias whether it's through they're just not interested whether it's just you don't gel with that person whatever it is that's fine i mean it's not fine from a discrimination perspective but what i mean is it's fine that you just don't waste your energy trying to communicate to someone who doesn't want to listen okay so honing in that energy and the focus that you have to people that are willing to listen to go on a journey whatever it might be to hear what you're talking about and I think there's a, the, the power and certainly the things that I spend time doing is harnessing that power of, okay, if you don't want to listen to me, then I won't speak. And that's fine. I will speak to the people that do want to listen. And um, that means I just don't waste time because I don't have time to waste anyway. Um, but I think having that, spending that time understanding your own strengths and growth areas, like before I move into any new role or promoted or whatever it is, I spend time really giving myself feedback, you know, what are the three things that I've done really well this quarter? What are two things I could have done better? And I analyze myself in that way, because I think it gives me an inert, an inert ability that, you know, before someone tells me what my feedback areas might be, I already know because I spent the time and I know myself certainly better than anybody else does. So think about it in that way as well, that, you know, feedback for you from a constructive point of view and a positive point of view should come from yourself as well as, you know, all the people around you. So, so there's a, a, a bit of research done by the World Economic Forum where they say women are not speaking up in Zoom calls and yeah. so we're losing visibility. So this was the problem before we went into this virtual world and it's becoming even bigger of a problem now that we are on Zoom calls with hundreds and sometimes thousands of people on the call. And yeah. um, what advice do you have for people about speaking up so they can be known to be in the room, one, mm -hmm. and also that they can be known for having something to contribute and to the topics for on discussion. Yeah, I think there's two things. I think the first thing is quite often we people worry about speaking up because they're worried that they don't have, I guess, all of the credibility to say something or that they're, you know, they're, they're not the right person to speak. Very frankly, most people that speak 
don't know what they're talking about. So, I mean, I, <laughs> I wouldn't True. worry about, you know, saying something and maybe it not being entirely correct or it's not entirely where you want to be. And it's important that you caveat that saying, you know, these are my thoughts and I'm still working it out, but I would love to share this. And I think if you, you either you don't share and that you don't you don't have your voice heard or you do share and you do have your voice heard so you either stop yourself or you don't and i think the the po the purpose of speaking up i know can be difficult what i would suggest as well for the second point is start to think about ways you can do it in a safe space that feels really safe for you before you're in you know big big meetings you know do you have a daily stand up where maybe you're more quiet than usual that you can talk up when there's five people in the room can you start to think about how you might you know facilitate conversations within small teams firstly so as you have the confidence you get through i guess that that hurdle that that um, confidence barrier that worry about speaking up um, i mentor quite a lot of people um in the in the industry men and women um all people of color and the 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 thing that i try to take most of them on is really that understanding of you know how do you start up small and then go to big? Like I speak in front of like thousands and thousands of people and it doesn't bother me because I just don't care anymore. But at the start, I wasn't like that. I was very nervous. My hands would get all sweaty. My voice would get shaky and so on. But I started to do it in safe spaces. And then I built my confidence and went up and up and up. And think about the ways you can do that as well. Maybe it is even just at home. You know, if there's friends that you can speak to on Zoom calls and stuff and start to, you know, try and bat ideas around instead of being quieter. Um, realistically when we speak up and you know we continue to get that confidence we progress and it's really important that i guess we all build on that confidence and yes environments and so on need to facilitate this better but i also want us to i guess harness our own confidence in moving forward too yeah so so the world has changed a lot we started lockdown and then there was george floyd and then now we have kamala harris who is the first vice president female vice president from a, a non-white background and um, well first woman to be honest in a, a role like that obviously we've had presidents in other countries who have been females from across the country and the u.s is actually quite a bit late to this mm. um but obviously anything that happens in the u.s is big news mm. but what, what are some of the conversations you've been involved in around the shift that we are seeing um and how it's impacting women's role within the workplace i know it's a big question but um what have you seen what shifts have you seen yeah I, negatively? I think certainly from a dei leadership standpoint and as like an organizational transformation perspective what, what, what we have seen in the past um is certainly things have relied very very heavily on people speaking up and being comfortable to speak up psychological safety being a key factor there, but also actually having the confidence and privilege to feel like you can say what you need to say. And what we have, like what organizations are only now starting to really do, and certainly I've been doing it for a while, but what, what they're starting to look at is you can't replicate that at home easily. It's not easy to be able to replicate something like that when you have remote working, when you don't see people yes. in the office, when you don't have people's ears easily. And what you need is to start to have tooling and measurements in place that really allow you to capture, you know, all of your employees insights in a safe way that you can analyze breakdown per like protected characteristic to see how, let's say, black women in the UK face versus black women in the US, because it's very different conversations yeah. and all of those yeah. nuances. And what I do see is finally employees and organizations moving towards that organizational people analytics approach that allows us to understand success of inclusion as opposed to just success of diversity in metrics and rep representation because two of those things are incredibly important representation is not the only measure of success because people can leave people can be treated horribly and so on and you need to capture the other essence of that too um, and organizations are moving in that way and certainly that's a big part of the work i do at pecan is taking people on that journey um, but as always, it is a journey. Um, some people it will be faster than journey. others, um, but we'll get there, I hope. Yeah, some yeah, yeah. I, I think I'm filled with hope. Um, mm. I'm filled with hope because when I, when I go online now, I see so many different faces represented. I hear so many different stories. And, and you know, before, when I was looking for entertainment or I wanted something that was a bit more diverse, I always had to pretend to content from the US. But now on the BBC and 
just generally you just feel people are genuinely making an effort mm. and and we need to hold them to it because it's hard work and it's very easy to give up before we get to where we need to be but i'm very hopeful and um, and i'm sure a lot of the people on the call may be hopeful as well um I have been holding Sherry now and asking a lot of questions. So if you have any questions that you would like to put to her, please type it into the chat box and I'll read those out to her as we go through the interview. Okay, right. So Sherry, I know you've been super productive. You're a woman on a mission. You have a full-time job. You have your own business. Um, you do a lot of pro bono things and you're releasing a book as well in April. Mm -hmm. So. I know productivity has been a, a huge thing in the lockdown. It's not a competition, but it's good to know how other people are getting things done. So can you share a bit about your, your structure and routine and how you, you manage to cram so much into your day? Um, I mean, there are days I'm not very productive, I think as well. And I think that's a necessity. Um, I guess I, 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 I never say no to a good opportunity. And so in, March last year, um, a book publisher reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to write a book. And I was like, oh, okay, why not? Um, and so I don't turn down a good opportunity. So it takes a lot of work to write a book, of course, especially publishing, because you have an editing schedule and so on with a full-time job, whilst being married and not wanting to end up getting divorced and so on, um, <laughs> and in a lockdown. And I guess what I, what I am is I'm very strict with my time. So, you know, I work nine to five for my day job, I do a lot of keynotes and trainings and stuff sort of after that if I want to but again that's optional because it's my business um and then the book stuff was really focused in on weekends and things like that um would, would I say it was easy absolutely not um, it's incredibly difficult before I came to Pecon I took seven weeks off and I rattled through the rest of the book so I, I really needed to have that time because it is incredibly difficult to balance all of that and write a book that people are going to pay for um but being really strict I think is important and that means being really strict with the things that like whenever we could go to the gym you know going to the gym because that's something for me that is really important to me because I find that's a really good release for me because I have I had a personal trainer so it meant for those three or four hours a week where I was with her someone was telling me what to do instead of me telling somebody else what to do I wasn't the director for a change I wasn't the driver and it meant I, my brain wasn't having to engage in anything else um, and so I think that um is really important and likewise when it comes to like date nights or whatever it is with my husband like we've had to be really deliberate about those because it's not just like oh, on a Saturday oh let's go out for dinner somewhere it's like you know yeah. okay well we have to plan it now because we have to go and get stuff or do whatever we want to do so be deliberate is my guess my advice both about you know the things you want to get done from like a career perspective but also the relaxation point like um, one of the my, one of the favorite thing my favorite things my partner got me for Christmas makes me feel like a queen is like um, these really fancy silk pajamas and a bathrobe with my name or my initials inscribed on it so I feel like oh, a, like wow. a, a queen so every so often now what I do is like on the weekend I'm going to have a really nice shower with loads of nice stuff that I've bought. I'm going to put on my silk PJs at two o'clock in the day. I'm going to put on my fancy bathrobe and I'm just going to listen to some spa music. But being really deliberate about that means that I, I will do it then. Otherwise, I'll just not bother and just be stressed all the time. Yes. I, and I think we underestimate that. I think sometimes when information is too common, we think yes. it's not effective. And, and mm -hmm. that's for me, that's what I hear with the women we work with mm. around, you know, self-care. Yeah. Because everybody's talking about self-care, everybody's talking about mindfulness. So you think that yada yada yada, you know, I've heard that before. I want something different. Yeah. But then the biggest secret is that there is no secret. It's the simple and yeah. effective strategies done consistently over time mm -hmm. that really work. And mm -hmm. so if for you you have a schedule around waking up, getting dressed, doing your exercise, doing work, but then logging off at a set time and taking care of yourself, then you're feeding in yourself enough to be able to care for the other people in your life. And okay. I think I personally, I don't know about the other people on the call, but life is pretty hectic. Mm -hmm. um, you have two young children, one you can see coming in and out and trying to disrupt my flow. And, and another one who has live homeschooling and a husband who is a key worker, so he's at the hospital. And I have my own business and other things that I love doing. And then I'm not about to drop. So I, I try and cram all that in. And I, and I think I do a, a pretty good job of it. 
But I also need to make sure that, particularly in the lockdown, as much as I hate exercising, that I fit in that exercise because it just makes me feel better and lighter and yeah. able to take on the things that, you know, the day throws at me. Mm -hmm. And I think if there's anything that I'll tell people is there is no new secret recipe that you need to listen to the hundred podcast to find it's just a tried and tested simple things that our parents and our mothers have been telling us just take care of yourself so you can take care of the people around you and be able to deal with what life is going to be throwing at us mm. you know and um, there's a question here from and peace and peace is um she said great session sherry to what extent do you think being raised in your environment has influenced your confidence um, and she suspects that level of privilege cannot be underestimated. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the, the privilege of being raised with white parents cannot be underestimated. What I, and, I, and I think this is one of the things when we talk about privilege quite a lot, people get their back up, um, get, get frustrated because they think we're talking about specific situations. So I personally had a really difficult upbringing. My mother was a bully and a narcissist. Um, but me and my father were really close, which is why when he passed away last year, it was really difficult. Um, but my upbringing was really, really difficult. I had a lot of really traumatic events that when I list them out, and um, when I talk in therapy and stuff, my therapist is like, one of those things would be enough for someone to have to deal with no less the five things that you have. Um, and even with all of that, I am still immensely privileged from being you know, raised in an environment where despite the abuse and everything else, I have an accent like mine. I was able to go to university. I had food on my table every night. I had a pillow and so on. Um, and so actually, what, one of the reasons why I wasn't very confident growing up was, was because of how I was raised and certainly my mother's influence. But whenever I, as soon as I was 18 and as soon as I could leave that house, I was gone. Um, and that's why, again, one of the things where my confidence came from was flying my wings, I guess you call it, or you know, doing my own thing, getting away from that, you know, abusive narcissistic environment and household and um that's why for me that moment of getting away and then when I met my partner for me that was a really big thing because I was so used to someone always talking me down and telling me it was rubbish and everything I did wasn't good enough and so on and so forth and then when I found someone who bigged me up with everything and is my biggest fan and um absolutely I guess empowers me to do what I want to do and supports me it was a really big shift and then that's whenever I started to even get more confident because I was like well actually I didn't have to put up with all that stuff or I did put up with it for you know 18 20 something years until she passed away but um I don't have to now and there is a, an immense amount of privilege in that for sure um, and I, I talk about it quite a lot certainly about the privilege of my accent and my name. So my middle name, and it's my Twitter handle, which is at Nirashika, which is my Sri Lankan name. So that is my middle name. And my my parents did almost call me Nirashika Atchison, but then decided on Sheree instead and put it in my middle name instead. And I am entirely aware of the privilege that gives me, because if my name was Nirashika Atchison, I know I would be treated differently, even with the big, thick Irish accent that I have. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I, I entirely agree that that level of privilege cannot be underestimated. And my personal circumstances still doesn't take away the amount of privilege that I have had from that scenario, for sure. Great yeah. question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, when it comes to privilege, I think, I think um, it's a word that gets thrown around quite a lot, but we all have privilege, you know? Yeah. It, 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 privilege is not a thing that only white people or men or no. the in group has everybody has privilege you just need to look at a set of different parameters and yeah. hello you have privilege and and really the question we should be asking ourselves is not holding other people to account for you know what you do with their privilege but what can we also do in our own lives with the privilege that we have so i have a platform i have a name griselda togobo which is a foreign name and a foreign accent but I don't see it as a disadvantage. And I don't see why people think their name or their accent is a disadvantage because there are billions of, the, of people in the world with names and accents that are non-European or non-British mm. or non-American. Um, and you need to take pride in that. So if you're going into a situation where somebody discriminates on you because of your accent and your name, then it's their loss because you need to believe that you have something to offer them. And if they choose not to accept 
accept that, then you can take it somewhere else to people who are more open-minded and more accepting. So you can do a great job for them. So I, uh, yeah, I, I, I come at that from a completely different angle. And I think we just need to sometimes, you know, spend a bit of time and educate people that an accent is not, it, it gives you privilege in the UK if you're applying to certain companies. But if you look at the whole world, you know, an accent, you can be in Ghana and have a British accent and people will think, you know, not the best thing about you because you have a British accent. So let's let's just try and not put any group of people on the pedestal and let's try and see all of society as people that are worthy of love and affection, of correction, of interaction. Let's continue to bring all of our whole selves into discussions because that's the only way we're going to change things, you know, if we don't, if we don't shy away from the difficult discussions. Right, so that was me going off on privilege. <laughs> and I think I think it's really important. I do think it's important as well. There's like the systemic imbalance of having, you know, a, let's say having a British accent and being in Ghana um, and the, the, the power imbalance that, that there is for sure. And I think, you know, I have the view, I guess, that accents do play it because we see quite a lot of bias based in, in by, around accents. Accent Bias Britain does a really great, um, analysis and there's US equivalents and APAC equivalents and so on too. Um, and I think there is an immense amount of strength in understanding your own privilege, but also understanding just how society really plays to some people and others, because like it does happen and it, it can be difficult to, you know, always have to think, okay, well, if they don't want to listen or they, they're, they're not willing to listen to me because of X, Y, Z, that I move on because we shouldn't always have to move on. So, and that's certainly where the role for me um, and other people that work in senior leadership like this, our role should be to stop that consistent having to, okay, I'll move then, I'll do something else. You shouldn't have to um, as well, because there are a lot of, you know, rubbish people out there. <laughs> um, and, and that's just, that's unfortunate, but we need to do something about it. It needs to be accountability for that too. Yes, and it's, it, it's down to leadership. And, it, you know, as women on this call who may be fortunate enough to, to lead uh, within the work that we do, it's down to us because we, if you're a woman, chances are you've experienced some kind of gender bias some mm -hmm. point in your career. And whether it's had a big impact or not, you know, it's quite relative. So we've been in those shoes. So I think we should be bringing that, that, um, that experience to how we lead. So we are more empathetic and we're more open to bringing the inclusion discussion to the table. Um, but we we have a long way to go, and I think everybody has something to contribute towards that. So, any more questions from the audience? If not, we'll move on and talk about Sherry's new book. Sherry, can you tell us about the book? Yeah, of course. So, um, my book is called Demanding More, published by Kogan Page. And the reason I, I wrote the book, I guess, was um, I was very frustrated with how people start a journey of DE&I with starting at allyship and just moving forward, which meant they didn't actually spend quite a lot of time or enough time understanding that people brought us this decision, the fact that we're in, a, in an environment that is incredibly unequal and inequitable, that these have been deliberate decisions to get us to this position. And it wasn't good enough to just decide, I want to do something better and move forward. You have to really understand the history from all of the different areas around, you know, people of color, of, um, disability, sexual orientation, gender, and all of the intersections of that. And the purpose of the book was to teach people about why you know, we're in this position, how we've been purposefully exclusive as humans as a whole. So as we can be purposefully inclusive moving forward, so providing then a lot of useful, meaningful, personal and systemic changes that we all need to make. And each chapter is paired with an industry leader interview. So for example, the chapter on privilege is paired with um, an interview with the CEO of Starling Bank, Anne Bowden, who talks about how she's working in her, how she started a bank to really create a more inclusive fintech, and interviews with um, people like Brian Reeves, who's the Chief Diversity Officer at Dell, about how he's using inclusion at a global scale with a company like Dell to really leave the world better than, it, than he found it, and a whole host of other interviews in there too. And the, the purpose of it for me is an action point, an action plan for people to do things and to do it better and to stop, I guess, tiptoeing around the issue, but to actually really own the fact that humans have brought us to this position and it's up to us now as humans to, to change it. 
Fabulous. And so for anyone wanting to get a copy of the book and to pre-order, I've just, we've shared a link in the chat box so you can find out um, about the book on Amazon and Goodreads and order. And I think she's given us a code as well. Sherry oh, has yeah. given us a code called Demanding More. Um, and you can use that to get 20% off. I'm a huge uh, advocate for, for us supporting um, small businesses, supporting women, supporting voices that may not have been heard in the past um, because a lot of the books published they are not always from um, diverse voices because of the bias within the publishing sector as well so if you can support sherry um, and learn something for yourself of course it's not it's not charity she's actually fantastic at what she does <laughs> so you'll be learning a lot and uh, we'll all be going much further together um, so if we don't have any more questions, I'd just like to thank you so much for joining us for this call. So the in, in conversation with uh, monthly conversations that I have with fabulous female leaders from across our community. And if you're here for the first time, I'd like you to encourage I'd like to encourage you to go over to our website forwardladies.com and, and, and sign up for free. We have a free membership where you can join a circle and interact with women or within our site. And one of the things I love about the work that I do with our community is that we are a diverse, inclusive community of women, um, both from the corporate space and from SMEs as well. And I know that tends to be two worlds that never come together. So we have a, a, a power circle for female founders. We have a career club for women in corporate. And I've asked Sherry to kindly join the BAME power circle because I am trying to build a list of fabulous diverse leaders where I can, uh, you know, direct young and up and coming talent who are just seeking to speak to somebody else who can uh, understand some of the challenges that, it's, that they are facing. So if you're not already a member of Forward Ladies, I encourage you to do that. And um, this recording is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you can head over there and give us a subscribe, that will be fabulous. And of course, if you love what you, we are doing, Please, next time, come with a friend. Don't come on your own. Um, thank you all so much for joining us once again and have a fabulous, fabulous um, day. I'll be in the power circle if you need to see me. <laughs> Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.